question. So um, we, we're very much looking forward to it. I wanna uh, have, we have one quick announcement before we, we begin regarding next week's seminar. And so next week's seminar will be someone from outside of our division. He's a new um, infectious disease physician in the medical school. And he's been working with some of the School of Public Health uh, collabor collaborators on both COVID-19 as well as HIV. His name is Dr. Kevin Eskadan. He's from Columbia originally, and he'll be speaking on the science policy interface and challenges in public health. And he'll use the case of COVID-19. And Kevin's um, a super interesting, super new. He just came in December. So he's very much looking forward to meeting um, a lot of new people in the School of Public Health as his area and training has overlapped with us. So please do um, make it back next week if you are interested in those topics. But today, again, we're so excited to have our postdocs with us today. Kelsey Johnson received her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania where she studied human population genetics and statistical genetics. She's now a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Genetics, Cell Biology, and Development at the University of Minnesota. And she's advised by Ron Beckman and Frank Albert. She's been working closely with Ellen Demereth, which is, gives her a connection here in our division. Kelsey's research focuses on the genetics and genomics of human milk and its effect on infant growth and development. Emily Nagel received her PhD from the University of Minnesota, Department of Nutrition, where she studied body composition methods for preterm infants. She is currently a third year postdoctoral fellow here in our division, the School of Public Health, and is primarily mentored by Ellen Demereth, um, as well as Dr. Sarah Rammel in the Division of Neonatology, Dr. Ellen Demereth and Dr. Sarah Rammel. Emily's research focuses on maternal factors which influence milk composition, breastfeeding outcomes, and infant health. She is also a pediatric registered dietitian with expertise in clinical nutrition for GI diseases. So welcome both of you. Thank you so much for presenting today. Um, they asked that they take questions at the end of their presentation. And at that time, you'll be uh, free to either unmute or uh, drop your question in the chat box. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Nagel, for presenting today. Thank you very much, Ruby, and thanks to you all for having us and for uh, well, inviting us to come talk today. Um, we're excited to present our work on uh, the milk study, and um, we're trying something a little bit new. We're each going to go back and forth a little bit talking about our research. So happy to uh, hear your comments and questions at the end about the research and also about the talk format. So <laughs> just to give you an overview of what we're going to talk about today, first we'll give a bit of a background on um, the questions and the milk study overall, and then we're both going to talk about aspects of our research related to um, maternal factors that determine milk composition. And then we'll each talk about Kind of the other side of the equation, so how uh, human milk impacts infant growth and development. And then finally, we'll each talk uh, time allowing about uh, future directions. Um, so human milk is a very complex biological system. In addition to the uh, macro and micronutrients that feed the baby, uh, it also contains its own milk microbiome, so bacteria and fungi in milk, and then a large hundreds of uh, bioactive, so non-nutritive factors in milk that, such as um, antibodies, hormones, proteins, human milk oligosaccharides or HMOs, which are um, sugars in milk, which the baby cannot digest, but uh, feed bacteria in the infant gut um, and immune cells. So. This is just a short list, but there's actually hundreds of compounds that have been identified in milk. And um, so the main focus of our research is how these, all these factors vary across women and what are the factors that influence their composition in milk. So this is just an overview of like the major aspects of both mom and baby that can drive changes in human milk uh, volume and composition. So we know that mom's diet, health, genetics, stress, and environment all play a role in determining um, her milk composition and lactation outcomes. And also 
there's been some research suggesting that infant factors such as the baby's size, sex, and health, the gestational age of birth all also impact milk and lactation. Um, but then of course, the milk cup, the big interest is how do all of these changes in uh, milk composition impact baby and mom's health and development. So variation in milk composition has also been linked to a wide variety of infant health outcomes, including um, growth and body composition, micronutrient status, gut health, particularly the infant gut microbiome I'm gonna talk about today um, and other aspects of development. So we're, the overarching theme of today is the mom milk baby triad. The mom, how does mom, maternal factors impact all of these components in milk? And then downstream from that, how does that matter for baby's growth and health? Um, and we just wanted to say today that we're going to be using the terms mother and breastfeeding in our presentation, but we do want to acknowledge that there are diverse experiences in lactation, and we also affirm the position of the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine um, that states that each lactating person should be encouraged to choose whichever terms for milk and feeding with which they identify. Um, and some of you, or many of you may be aware of some of the benefits of breastfeeding for both mom and baby. For mom, those can include a lower risk of certain cancers like breast and ovarian cancers, um, a decreased risk for type two diabetes and high blood pressure, and for baby, uh, lower risk of asthma, type one diabetes, uh, SIDS, and some um, infections, GI infections, ear infections, uh, et cetera. You can go to the next slide. And then today we are gonna be talking about data from the MILK study. I love this name, it's so clever. Um, Mothers and Infants Link for Healthy Growth Study. Um, and this is research out of um, Dr. Ellen Demarest's group here in the division. Um, and some of the relevant goals of the study that we'll be covering today include uh, to identify human milk bioactives that differ by maternal pregnancy, metabolic, and weight status, um, and also to identify human milk bioactives that are associated with infant growth and metabolic outcomes. Um, and I do want to mention this is an ongoing prospective cohort study, um, and our mothers in the study intended to exclusively breastfeed for at least three months. And were recruited from both Minneapolis and Oklahoma City. Um, and so far the cohort consists of 367 women who were initially recruited during healthy low-risk pregnancies um, and their singleton infants born at term age. You can go to the next slide. And so here are um, some of the inclusion and exclusion criteria for the MILK study. Um, I'm not going to read all of them to you, um, but I just wanna point out again that the women in the study were self-reported to have social support for and intended to breastfeed for at least three months. Um, and in the cohort we're talking about today, um, they did not have a history of or current type one, two or gestational diabetes. You can go on. Uh, and here are some of the characteristics of our cohort. Um, they were highly educated. 76% of them had a bachelor's degree or higher. 86% of them were white. Uh, they were mean age of about 31 years old. Um, and also you can see that they had an extremely high rate of exclusive breastfeeding, both at three months and uh, continuing through six months. And now Kelsey's gonna talk about some, uh, well, we're both gonna talk about maternal factors that may relate to milk composition, but uh, Kelsey's going to dive into maternal genetics. Yep. <clears throat> okay, so why, do, why should we study the genetics of human milk? Well, if we can understand the genes that underlie mammary gland function, we can learn more about lactation biology. An understanding of milk genetics will also, also help us learn about the evolution of lactation through both um, comparative approaches, comparing um, milk biology genetics in humans to other mammals, and also um, potentially comparisons within humans of the genetic factors influencing lactation within, across human populations. Um, and a primary interest or driver for, for my research is that we need to have an understanding of the genetic basis of milk composition to be able to use genetic epidemiology tools to understand the effects of milk composition and lactation on infant and maternal health. 
So one way you could imagine going about this would be to do a genome-wide association study of one or all of the milk traits of interest. So like, you know, we I had the slide at the beginning saying there's hundreds of components in milk. So wouldn't it be great if we could measure all of those components in 10,000 women and have all of their genetic information and then do a genome-wide association study on all of those uh, components. That would be really cool, but obviously not really feasible in the near term, certainly not during my postdoc. Um, so uh, I'm taking a slightly different approach, which is to measure milk gene expression. Gene expression being the measured by RNA sequencing, so all the RNA in milk, which gives us a profile of all of the genes being expressed at the time of sampling of the milk. And um, this gives us a genome-wide profile of what's happening in the mammary gland in a large number of women at a reasonable scale. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that, but first I just wanted to, to touch on the facts that this is a very understudied area. There's only a few known genetic associations with human milk composition. One being um, the uh, fatty acid desaturase gene cluster, which has been associated with uh, the fatty acid profile of human milk. And the other probably best known example is the FUT2 gene or fucosyl transferase gene, which is associated with human milk oligosaccharide composition. So these are the, I mentioned at the beginning, these are sugars in milk, which they make up about 10 to 15% of the dry mass in milk, but they're um, not digested by the infant, they're digested by microbes in the infant gut. So they're synthesized in the mammary gland. Mom's putting a lot of energy into creating all of these sugars and they're not providing any nutrition, direct nutrition to the infant at all. And this food too, um, genetic polymorphism, which is common in human populations, is a really strong determinant of the HMO profile of milk. So um, this, this plot is showing you the average uh, HMO profile for either non-secretors, so moms that have two non-functional copies of this gene versus secretors, which are moms that have at least one functional copy. And um, each color is a different HMO. So you can see that on average, moms that have functional food two have a lot more HMOs, but also the kinds of HMOs that are there are different. So for example, this red and this like light blue HMO are pretty much not absent in non-secretors. So um, you can see that why this is a well-known genetic factor influencing milk composition, because it has such a huge uh, influence on the mom's HMO phenotype. But um, of course, this leaves the rest of the genome and all the other components of milk pretty much unexplored at this point in terms of the role of maternal genetics. So as I mentioned, I'm gonna be using milk gene expression to, um, as a proxy to understand mammary gland function and milk composition. So this is a diagram of a lactating mammary epithelial cell. And so if when we extract RNA from milk, it's basically a snapshot of what's happening in these lactocytes, these epithelial cells, because during the process of lactation, um, these cells uh, produce milk fat globules, which are shown here, so these like yellow circles. And the way that um, milk fat is secreted into milk is by um, this process of budding off of part of the cell, including the cell membrane in creating these milk fat globules. And so part of the cytosol of the epithelial cell is also transferred to these milk fat globules that go into the milk. And so when we extract RNA from milk, we're getting basically a snapshot of the, all the RNA that's in the lactating mammary epithelial cell. And so that helps us understand all the processes that are ongoing in that cell during lactation in terms of all the proteins that are being produced. Well, the genes that are being transcribed. And so the approach that I'm going to be used to understand the genetic effects on gene expression is called the looking expression quantitative trait loci or EQTLs. So if we have a population of people and we take two of them and we 
uh, imagine that they have a genetic variant at this star. So this is kind of a cartoon of two people's genome where um, the star is a genetic variant and there's a gene nearby that's being transcribed. And so the person with a blue star, this genetic variant is at the side of a transcription factor, which is turning on gene expression. If you have a blue star, the transcription factor binds and that might result in higher levels of gene expression. Whereas if you have the yellow star genetic variant, maybe that interrupts the transcription factor binding in some way. And so that results in overall less transcription of the nearby gene. And so um, this, is, this would result in an EQTL, meaning that this genetic variant is correlated with the gene expression levels, the number of transcripts of this nearby gene. And most of the time it is gonna be something like a transcription factor binding site or other non-coding variant nearby. So most of the EQTLs that we identify are not gonna be coding variants that actually change the protein sequence, but rather change the uh, transcription level of a nearby gene. So when we look at this in data, we can see that um, the genotype on the x-axis of the mom is correlated with the levels of gene expression. So for each copy of the A allele, there appears to be increased gene expression. And this is what an EQTL looks like in data. So um, for today's presentation, I'm going to be using one month milk gene expression that we have from the milk study, as well as maternal genotypes that we have through DNA sequencing. Later, I'm gonna also be talking about um, infant fecal microbiomes and uh, we have some human milk oligosaccharide profiles for these individuals as well. So we have, given that we have this data set, we have mom's gene expression from milk, for all of our samples, we have this for about 17,000 genes. And then we're testing nearby genetic variants. So we have mom's genotype for each sample. And then we do the tests that I described where we're testing for the linear relationship between mom's genotype and gene expression of nearby genes. And um, for our sample size, about 170 people identified about 2,700 genes that had at least one significant um, genetic variant affecting gene expression. So what that actually looks like for a single gene uh, on the x-axis here, I'm plotting the genomic position of many genetic variants. Each genetic variant is a dot. And the blue line here is showing the position of the gene casein 3 or kappa casein, which is one of the primary uh, proteins in human milk. And the y-axis is the p-value uh, of strength of association of each genetic variant to gene expression of casein 3. So you can see that there's this like cluster of linked genetic variants nearby that all are really strongly associated with casein 3 expression levels. And this, what this actually looks like uh, at the individual level. So for the most strongly associated gene, each of these dots is a person. We see that for each copy of the A allele in our data, on average, moms have lower expression of casein-3. So one of the first questions we wanted to answer once we generated this EQTL data set was whether the milk EQTLs are unique to milk or whether they're shared across other human tissues, because this will give us an idea of how the genetic regulation in milk for which genes it's really some, a unique process in milk or is it something that's shared across the human body? So to do this, I looked at um, an EQTL data set from, with tissues from uh, dozens of human tissues from something called the GTEx Consortium, which is a large NIH-funded study. And I basically looked to see for these uh, genetic uh, association statistics, for example, at this gene, ALDH1A1, does it look like the EQTL in milk is uh, very different from what we see in blood? for example, or do they appear to line up very well? Like in this example of the Elgalis 9 gene where milk and spleen have pretty much the same EQTL suggesting that there's a single genetic variant that drives gene expression in both milk and spleen. And this is called um, co-localization. So we use this approach to basically for every gene with a milk EQTL, is that EQTL unique to milk or is it shared with other tissues? <clears throat> 
And I found when I looked across all of the tissues of comparison, those that had the most EQTL shared with milk were other secretive tissues, which makes sense. So things like salivary gland, stomach pancreas, tissues that are doing a lot of secretion, share a lot of genetic regulation of gene expression, even more than the resting breast, the so non-lactating breast. Um, and then the tissues that are most different are not surprisingly brain and testes, which from the GTEx we already know are very like distinct and kind of weird tissues compared to the rest of the body. And when we look at, there are about 600 genes where the milk QTL is not shared with any other tissue. And this identified a lot of genes that made sense. So things that we already know have important roles in milk and lactation, like the casein gene I mentioned, the main milk protein, but also um, genes that play a role in lipid secretion ductile branching, the mammary gland, and fatty acid synthesis. Um, but of course, out of 600, a lot of them are going to be things that we don't really know immediately what their obvious role is in lactation. So this is just one example. Of course, there's hundreds more. So these are potential, um, potential targets for follow-up research or investigation as to what these genes might be doing in, in uh, the process of lactation. All right, turning to Emily. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, so now we're going to switch gears a little bit. I'm going to talk about how maternal metabolic status may be associated with altered milk composition and with breastfeeding duration. Um, and um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, many of us are aware of the health benefits of breastfeeding um, that I mentioned previously. But when we look at US breastfeeding data, few women are meeting the guidelines or their own goals for express, or exclusive breastfeeding. Um, so both the World Health Organization and the American Academy of Pediatrics recommend exclusive breastfeeding for an infant's first six months of life, followed by breastfeeding and the introduction um, of complementary foods for as long as um, desired by mother and infant um, with continued breastfeeding. Um, but according to the CDC, 75% uh, of moms don't meet these guidelines for exclusive breastfeeding and 60% of moms do not meet their own breastfeeding goals. Next slide. Um, here are um, some of the factors which influence breastfeeding, um, and it's commonly assumed that breastfeeding outcomes are determined via social and not biological mechanisms, um, some of those that you can see there. But two of the factors that we're primarily interested in um, are inadequate milk supply and lactation difficulty, which have both been associated with altered, or altered maternal metabolic status. Next slide. Um, previous research from uh, the MILK study uh, found that positive associations between pre-pregnancy BMI um, and excessive gestational weight gain and MILK components related to metabolic health, um, including CRP, leptin, and insulin. Um, we also know that abnormalities in metabolic health, um, such as those observed with gestational diabetes, are linked with suboptimal breastfeeding outcomes. Uh, however, it's not clear whether the concentrations of these bioactive components um, are related to metabolic, which are related to metabolic health, are also associated with breastfeeding outcomes. Next slide. We should have made a signal or something. <laughs> um, so for this study, we decided to examine the associations between milk components that are related to metabolic health and uh, the initiation of infant formula, um, which would be in, in effect cessation of exclusive breastfeeding or, or full breastfeeding um, at the three and six months uh, time points postpartum. So uh, we included 363 participants in the milk study, um, and then we looked at uh, concentrations of milk bioactives that are related to metabolic health um, informed by our previous uh, studies um, that would include the hormones leptin and insulin, uh, the inflammatory cytokines, CRP and IL-6, and we also looked at glucose um, using ELISA assays. And then um, milk bioactive concentrations at one in three months, and then the risk of formula introduction at three and six months were evaluated um, using modified Poisson regression models with robust error variants. Um, and we adjusted our models for multiple covariables and potential confounders, um, some of which I spoke about before, uh, maternal education level, delivery mode, parity, our pre-pregnancy BMI, um, dietary quality, among others. Um, and we did standardize our bioactive concentrations um, to aid in comparison of our effect sizes. Next slide. 
So here you can see um, mean milk bioactive concentrations at one month postpartum, and also changes in these concentrations from one to three months postpartum by feeding outcome, um, formula feeding FF versus fully breastfeeding um, at three months postpartum. And I've just highlighted um, a few of um, our, uh, a few uh, points in the figure here, um, looking at um, both insulin, um, leptin and glucose. Um, and you can notice there are, are clear differences um, in mean concentrations um, for, these, uh, for these bioactives at the one month time point. Next slide. Um, so the results of our analysis showed that for our one month milk concentrations, higher milk glucose was associated with a lower risk of formula feeding at three months postpartum, while we saw that higher leptin, insulin, um, and then their changes from one to three months postpartum were associated with an increased risk of formula feeding at three months. Uh, we did not see any relation between milk CRP or IL-6 and formula feeding at the three month time point. Um, and then at six months postpartum, we observed only an association between the change in insulin um, from three to six months postpartum and formula feeding, um, such that an increase in insulin was associated with a higher risk of formula feeding. You can go on. So what are the mechanisms that could possibly explain these relations? Um, so for regarding leptin, we found that leptin was associated with an increased risk of formula initiation. And leptin is an appetite regulating hormone and it can disrupt or it may disrupt breastfeeding. Uh, by inhibiting mu muscle contractions, um, which would slow milk ejection. Um, serum leptin also correlates with milk leptin um, and has been observed to be inversely associated with serum prolactin and with 24-hour milk expression in lactating women. And prolactin is an important hormone which stimulates milk production. Uh, leptin may also work by uh, reducing infant appetite. Um, so that could reduce the demand for and subsequent volume of milk. Um, and overall, our finding that higher leptin was associated with increased risk of formula initiation is consistent with the mechanistic role of leptin in lactation. Now, regarding insulin, we found that a higher milk insulin was associated with a greater risk of formula feeding at three months. Um, and elevated milk insulin is associated with insulin resistance um, and with gestational diabetes and subsequent breastfeeding difficulties like delayed onset of lactation and breastfeeding cessation. Um, but insulin has a really important role in milk production. Um, it's involved in expression of genes um, in milk synthesis and secretion. So uh, insulin sensitivity is very important for milk production or adequate milk production. And then finally, glucose. Um, this one is one that might confuse um, some of you. It confused me at first as well. Um, it's a precursor, glucose is a precursor to lactose and the mammary gland requires an adequate supply of glucose for milk production. So the concentration of milk glucose is actually proportional to the rate of milk secretion. So it does make sense that higher glucose concentration in milk, which would be reflective of a higher rate of milk secretion would be associated with a lower risk of formula introduction. You can go to the next slide. So from, um, in this study, we observed that milk components, which are related to metabolic health, were associated with the risk of formula introduction in mothers who intended to exclusively breastfeed. And our future work, um, we hope to examine potential mechanisms by which these bioactives may affect lactation function. Um, we're particularly interested in that kind of milk output um, mechanism in uh, relation to suboptimal glucose tolerance or insulin resistance um, in women without gestational diabetes. We can go to the next slide. Okay, now we're gonna switch gears and talk about some infant outcomes um, related to milk composition. So, okay, so I told you that we looked for genetic associations between mom's genotype and milk gene expression as a proxy for what was happening in the mammary gland. Um, so of course we're interested in whether these changes in gene expression actually matter for uh, the components in milk and ultimately infant health. Uh, today I'm focusing on the in infant gut microbiome, which is um, a trait that we have measured in a subset of the milk study participants. Um, and uh, we're interested in the infant gut microbiome because it's associated with uh, a lot of uh, outcomes in 
uh, immune related outcomes in infancy and also in later childhood, such as um, asthma and allergic disease. Um, in preterm infants, the gut microbiome is associated with uh, risk for necrotizing and enter enterocolitis. And um, breastfeeding and best breastfeeding versus formula feeding is the factor that has been shown to make have the largest association with changes in the infant gut microbiome. There hasn't been very much research looking at um, differences in milk composition and changes in the infant gut microbiome. Of course, that's what we're interested in today. So um, to see if there is this potential relationship, I looked at uh, the milk EQTLs, genetic variants, which we know have an effect on mammary gene exp expression and tested for associations between maternal genotypes of that milk EQTL and their infant's gut microbiome, the abundance of particular bacteria in the infant gut to kind of test this hypothesis. <clears throat> and one of our um, strongest associations that we were particularly interested in was an association between uh, a lactase EQTL, the a gene that produces lactase enzyme that digests lactose. So a genetic variant that um, drives to expression of lactase in mom's milk and its association with infant fecal colonzella abundance. Colonzella is a beneficial microbe, uh, abundant beneficial microbe in the gut of uh, breastfed babies. So a reminder, these are all exclusively breastfed babies. So we found that uh, each copy of the G allele in mom was associated with a decrease in the level of colonzella in babies. Um, the reasons we were particularly interested in this relationship was that <coughs> the um, lactase EQTL is also the genetic variant or on the haplotype that determines lactose tolerance in adults. So these moms, on the right with lower infant colonzella are also likely to be uh, lactose tolerant, whereas these moms, which are um, two copies of the A allele, are likely lactose intolerant moms. So um, this obviously has a big effect on uh, mom's diet and digestion and potentially her milk composition. So um, another interesting fact about the lactase EQTL is that it confers, as I said, lactase persistence post weaning, meaning that it determines mom uh, adult lactose tolerance. So <clears throat> in um, adults, if you have, a, if you're lactase persistent, you produce lactase in your small intestine and you're able to digest lactose. Whereas in adults that do not express lactase in adulthood, they uh, do not express they're not able to digest lactose. So this is in adults, one of the few replicated genetic variants that's also associated with the adult gut microbiome. And the, the rationale for why we think we see this association is that for um, lactase persistent adults, if the lactose is being digested in the small intestine, that leaves less uh, bacteria less lactose for bacteria to then digest in the large intestine. And conversely, in a lactase non-persistent adults, um, the lactose is, remains and is able to be digested. And so um, this, the strongest association in adults is seen for bifidobacterium, which is another uh, beneficial microbe in the human gut. And it's one of the hallmarks of the infant gut actually in that healthy infants are thought to have high levels of bifidobacterium. And it's correlated with the levels of colonzella in the infant gut. So this is from our data, but this has also been observed in, in other studies that the levels of colonzella in the infant gut are correlated with the levels of bifidobacterium. So to put this uh, relationship in context with other known modifiers of the infant gut microbiome, um, here's our uh, lactase UQTL by Colonzella abundance plot again. And this uh, plot on the right is showing for um, Colonzella and the infant gut, the effect of cesarean versus vaginal delivery, which is another um, well-known uh, 
factor that's associated with differences in the infant gut microbiome. <clears throat> and you can see that um, on average, babies that had a vaginal delivery have higher levels of colantella, which is uh, consistent with what other studies have seen. It's thought to be a, like a beneficial microbe that's abundant in healthy babies. Not that cesarean babies aren't healthy, but on average, they have lower levels of this uh, microbe. And that the, uh, the effect size of our lactase EQTL is on par with that of the cesarean versus vaginal effect. So a potential model for how we might be observing, why we might be observing this association is that, um, as I mentioned, if we have this milky QTL, which is driving decreased mammary lactase expression, is that somehow affecting composition of milk, which then in these exclusively breastfed babies re results in increased levels of infant gut columns. Of course, another potential pathway is that we know that infant genotype is correlated with maternal genotype. Babies get one cup, one allele from their mom, and that could be driving this difference. Um, in the case of this genetic variant, we think that that's not what's happening because the lactase persistence phenotype only arises in adulthood or at least later in childhood because um, these babies are all producing a ton of lactase in their gut to be able to digest the milk that they're getting from their mom. So these are all healthy, normal infants. They're producing a lot of lactase. And so we don't think that a difference in this genotype driving a difference in lactase expression in the infant gut is what is um, causing this association. But of course, as I mentioned, we know that this genotype is on the haplotype that determines mom's lactose tolerance. And so it's certainly possible that differences in maternal diet or digestion are either changing um, mammary gene expression or bypassing that indirectly maternal diet has an effect on milk composition. And in our data set, we actually have uh, maternal diet information. So we can test this hypothesis. So, um, so I've looked so far at maternal lactose consumption. So how much lactose these moms are consuming and if that seems to explain uh, the effect we see. And it does not, at least uh, not in a simple way. So if this plot is showing um, for mom's genotype where the two on the right are the lactose, lactase persistence moms. So moms that are producing lactase in their gut into adulthood. And the y-axis is their um, average um, dietary lactose intake. We see that there, you know, there's probably a small dip effect here, but it's not big enough. And when we include this in our model, it doesn't explain the variation we see relating a maternal genotype to the infant gut colonzella. So, what is the potential mechanism by which milk lactase expression could possibly modify the breastfed infant gut microbiome? Well, we know that lactose forms the backbone of HMOs, the sugars that are in milk that specifically feed the infant gut microbes. And we also know that lactase does not digest HMOs. So it's probably not the case that um, the lactase is like digesting the HMOs before they ever get to the baby, for example. <clears throat> but it could be that um, increased lactase expression in the mammary gland results in decreased HMO production. And so um, we, we looked at this by looking at the relationship between a lactase expression in milk in our samples compared to the total abundance of HMOs. And we do see a negative relationship. So moms that have more lactase expression in their milk on average have lower total HMO abundance, which would be consistent with uh, lower levels of bifidobacterium and colonzella potentially. Um, so our working hypothesis at this point is that perhaps this milky QTL, which is decreasing that rate lactase expression results in increased HMO abundance and infant gut colonzella. Of course, this is still a hypothesis at this point, more work to be done. And we haven't completely, you know, ruled out the possibility that this has nothing to do with 
a mammary lactase expression and it's really acting through maternal diet. <clears throat> but it's something we're continuing to explore. Now Emily is going to talk about infant outcomes in her studies. Thanks, Kelsey. Um, yes, now I'm going to talk about, um, continue to talk about maternal diet, but a different outcome, uh, infant growth and adiposity. Um, we know that um, maternal diet uh, is important and it can influence, it can possibly influence growth outcomes. And that was um, kind of what we wanted to explore here. Um, many of our diet recommendations um, are not specific to pregnant women or the postpartum period during lactation. Um, I believe the most recent pregnancy nutrition guidelines were published about 30 years ago. Um, so we just wanted to understand how the relationship between adherence to dietary guidelines um, and infant growth and adiposity intersect um, in a cohort of infants that were primarily breastfed. Um, you can go to the next slide. Sorry, I should have had this one up while I was talking about that, but this is, a, um, this is again, the mother milk baby triad showing the areas um, in what, which um, the study examined. You can go to the next slide. All right, so for our maternal diet factors, we collected um, dietary data on the average daily intake of some specific components that we were interested in, including added sugar, fat, and fiber. And we also looked at whether the dietary recommendations for these uh, variables were met. Um, we actually looked at all three, um, including fiber, but hardly anyone met the fiber recommendations. So um, we didn't conduct an extensive analyses on fiber um, recommendations. And then for our infant growth outcomes, we did look at outcomes at six months um, for these infants, looking at percent body fat, and then the change in weight Z-score from zero to six months, and then the change in weight for length Z-score, um, or I'm sorry, just the weight for length Z-score, and then the length Z-score. And you can go to the next slide. Here are the diet variables that we examined, and then also the criteria for whether participants met the dietary guidelines. These are per the 2015-2020 um, guidelines, um, just because that's those are the guidelines the women would have been following for the study period. And then I just wanted to define added sugar intake in case that was unfamiliar. That, that just consists of uh, syrups or sugars that are added to food or beverages during processing. You can go to the next slide. So our participants were um, 349 mother infant dyads from the milk study, um, and our dietary variables were obtained using a food frequency questionnaire, uh, specifically the National Cancer Institute's Diet History Questionnaire 2 um, during the third trimester of pregnancy and at one and three months postpartum. We did end up using the mean intake for these three time points because the nutrient intakes across time points were moderately to strongly correlated and not significantly different in mean value. We also examined uh, the infant growth and body composition parameters you see here. As I previously mentioned, uh, we evaluated the anthropometrics, the weight and length using the WHO um, growth charts, and then we used DEXA to, uh, to assess uh, infant percent body fat. And then we used multiple linear regression models, which were adjusted for multiple covariables and potential compounders, which you see there. Um, to look at the relation between our dietary variables and infant percent body fat or growth parameters. And then we also looked at whether participants met or exceeded recommendations and then in conjunction with our infant outcomes. We again used um, our estimates were expressed per um, standard deviation of the independent variables just to allow us to look at effect sizes. You can go to the next one. Um, so uh, our participant characteristics were similar to those discussed at the top of the presentation, so I won't go over those here, but um, these are the mean values for the diet variables we evaluated. Um, and in terms of our dietary quality, that HEI score, um, healthy eating index score, um, our participants had a slightly higher diet quality uh, than the typical American score, which was um, which is about 59 with 100 being the highest um, quality diet. And you can see that just the mean values for the other um, components there. Go to the next slide. Okay, and then regarding whether um, participants met or exceeded dietary guidelines, most women exceeded recommendations for fat or saturated fat, um, and only 3% of women met recommendations for fiber, whereas most women met added sugar recommendations. So you can go to the next one. Um, and then regarding the association between our dietary components and infant adiposity, we did observe a positive association between fat and saturated fat, 
um, and infant percent body fat at six months. Um, that remained after we adjusted for our potential confounders. Um, and these values again are expressed per SD. So each SD of fat or saturated fat was associated with about a 1% increase in percent body fat. We didn't observe any other associations with our other dietary components. Can go to the next slide. Okay, and now um, looking at our dietary recommendations, um, we did see that infants of mothers who exceeded added sugar recommendations had a greater percent body fat um, compared with infants of mothers um, who met recommendations. So those who exceeded the recommendations had um, close to a 1% increase um, or 1% higher percent body fat than the ones who um, met the recommendations. You can go to the next slide. And now looking at our dietary components and our infant, infant anthropometrics, um, those would be um, our weight, length, um, Z-scores, et cetera. Uh, we only saw an association between added sugar, um, which was positively associated with infant weight for length Z-score at six months. You can go to the next one. So from this study, um, we found that maternal dietary intake of fat, saturated fat, and added sugar may influence infant percent body fat, although the effect is fairly small and the overall impact of adiposity at six months um, on later health is unknown. Um, and I also wanna say though, that there are still benefits to following the dietary guidelines, um, such as reducing or making sure you stay within the added sugar intake recommendations, because this would be beneficial to um, neurodevelopmental health for your infant, um, or you know, meeting the, the fiber recommendations um, would be beneficial to prevent constipation, which is a concern during pregnancy. Okay, you can go to the next one. Um, and now we briefly have, well, very, very quickly, um, go over some future directions since we are both postdocs and we're in the process of establishing our um, and defining our future independent research programs. But in the interest of time, I will very quickly explain um, my in my future work. Um, my, I have a K99 um, submission that is pending review this summer. And so um, I really hope to examine another um, maternal factor, which may be associated with suboptimal lactation outcomes, um, maternal psychosocial stress. And I won't go through this, this whole diagram, but it, it goes over some of the possible mechanisms by which stress may um, impair lactation. Um, and you can go to the next slide too. And then this is kind of um, my overall conceptual model for the study. Um, and th my population of interest is preterm infants. Um, they are at risk for suboptimal neurodevelopmental outcomes. Um, and we also know that um, breastfed infants, um, preterm infants have improved neurodevelopmental outcomes. Um, so that's kind of a, an area which I hope to explore whether maternal stress impacts milk composition, which in turn could affect infant neurodevelopment. So hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll get a great score and I'll be able to do that work. Um, so um, continuing looking at uh, milk EQTLs, something I'm really interested in looking at is gene by environment interaction. So all of the, the results and the participants that um, we looked at so far have been like women who have been able to successfully breastfeed and didn't have any pregnancy complications or um, other health, you know, serious health problems. So, but of course we know that, um, you know, our genes, the effect of our genetics isn't only when we're healthy, but there's differences in terms of, uh, what happens when we are sick. For example, um, one phenotype of interest for the milk study in Emily and I is um, in the context of gestational diabetes, which is a risk factor for um, delayed lactogenesis and uh, difficulties with establishing uh, lactation. So um, for example, if we have an EQTL uh, and we're looking, we can, instead of just looking at mom's genotype by gene expression, if we have a sample of both moms with and without gestational diabetes, we can look and see if there are genetic variants where uh, in the context of no gestational diabetes, we don't see a relationship with maternal genotype and gene expression. But in the context of gestational diabetes, we do see that mom's, mom's genetics impacts gene expression and potentially that this uh, genetic variation could be impacting um, mom's milk production. So 
that's uh, one future direction. Something else I'm interested in looking at is um, differences in the cellular composition of milk. So in addition to the mammary epithelial cells in milk, there's also a diverse cohort or diverse sample of maternal immune cells in milk, which are thought to perhaps have a role in the infant's immune development and protection from infectious disease in infancy. And so um, in the context of gestational diabetes, we're collecting new fresh milk samples so that we can isolate the cells from milk and then performing um, single cell RNA sequencing. So instead of sequencing all of the milk, all the RNA and the milk together, we can capture each cell separately and uh, measure the RNA in each cell. And then um, this plot is a UMAP plot, but it's kind of like a PC principal components plot in that it's just separating um, each cell by its gene expression. So clustering together cells that have similar gene expression. And so this is just a cartoon, obviously, but imagine that like these orange cells are mammary epithelial cells, and then the other colors are different kinds of immune cells in milk. So we can use this kind of approach to understand um, what are the cells in milk, but also how similar, how different they are, and what the different proportions are in contexts such as gestational diabetes versus not. So we can look at things like, do moms with gestational diabetes have less macrophages in their milk? This is just a made up example, but that's like the example of the kinds of questions we can ask with this data. And also within perhaps mammary epithelial cells, are there differences in gene expression? So uh, with that, uh, we have a lot of folks to thank, um, in particular, Ellen, our uh, advisor and the PI of the milk study where our samples and data have come from. Um, a lot of milk study co-investigators and staff. And then for me, my two advisors, Ron and Frank in their labs. Well, thank you, Dr. Nagel and Dr. Johnson. That was excellent. So one of the primary reasons to, um, to complete a postdoctoral fellowship is in order to have focused time and develop your own research. And clearly you've taken great advantage of that, the both of you. So now is the time for questions. They ask that um, you unmute and we can perhaps potentially also see your face when you um, ask your question. So I welcome any questions that you may have right now. Hey, great presentation. Um, really enjoyed hearing both of you speak today. My question is about the mom's microbiome. And if you've thought about how you will look to see if, if mom's DNA, I mean, you mentioned diet, but if her DNA is shaping her microbes and if what you're picking up with the, you, with the EQTLs is transfer of microbes from mom to baby, some of that like might be suggested by your cesarean vaginal comparison as well. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a great question. So unfortunately we don't have mom's gut microbiome at all. So we can't test like, first of all, we can't do what you said, which is like test mom's genetics versus her um, gut microbiome. Um, we do have, the milk microbiome, which we I haven't looked at yet. And um, it's a little bit challenging because there's a lot of like potential contamination in profiling the milk microbiome. So we're not as confident in like what our data are showing us. Um, but I mean, we do know, for example, like that, you know, moms that have moms that are have the lactase genotype where that makes them lactose tolerant on average have less bifidobacterium so i think what you're suggesting is like could it be that what we observe in the infants is because mom has more or less bifidobacterium for colonzella for example and i guess we've definitely thought about that and in my mind it's less of a probable reason because i don't think that like the establishment of the infant gut is proportional to like directly proportional to like how much of each bacteria is in mom's gut, but I'd be interested to hear if you think that would be a possible cause. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm genuinely curious. I think it's a really interesting area. Yeah. And of course it's hard to say because 
you know, all the environmental factors that mom's experiencing, baby is experiencing too. So that's what we're hoping that genetics can help us get at potentially. Yeah, great studies. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, I'd like to, oh, Abby again, absolutely. I can ask Abby. another question. Welcome yeah. back. I missed, I, I don't know if I caught it. Are these all first time moms or, and I can't remember from what I've done with this, like, have you looked to see if there are relationships with I think this is in, in relation to um, some of Emily's work, like the success or the introduction of formula feeding. Um, and if the mom is a second time mom or a first time mom, and if her prior breastfeeding experiences were um, positive or successful. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, thanks, Abby. Um, so they were not all first time moms. And um, we actually, I didn't have time to show all the data, but there's actually a survey that um, we distributed, I think at one in three months postpartum, maybe three and six, that asked about prior breastfeeding experience. Um, but we didn't find that to be um, different between those who continue to breastfeed successfully and those who did not. Um, and we also asked about, you know, confidence in breastfeeding or, you know, work support for breastfeeding, but we didn't really find any differences there. And I'm guessing I, it could be, be just because intention to breastfeed is so important. And so um, the women in this study, they all wanted to breastfeed and intended to breastfeed uh, for at least three months. So I'm guessing that's why we might not have seen such a big difference. And um, beyond that, we know that um, these kind of um, like social behavioral mechanisms don't completely explain um, for why women uh, stop breastfeeding. So kind of hinting more, at, there is still this biological component that we're really interested in that we need to explore further. So in the remaining time, oh, Kelsey, did you want to address it as well? No. no. So in the remaining time, I thought I'd ask um, one parting question and uh, it's about your experience in doing postdoctoral work in a division and, and school that actually wasn't a part of your original training. So um, you're coming from different disciplines and you're doing uh, additional training in public health and epidemiology. Um, how does it feel? What's worked and what, what maybe hasn't fit the way that you thought might? I can go first because my, I'll, I'll say that having like, being co-advised by uh, two faculty in the medical school slash college of biological sciences and also working with Ellen, like pretty much my only interaction with at BCH has been with Ellen and Emily and other members of the milk study. So it's been really great. And uh, Ellen's a super supportive mentor and helps me however I need. So um, I would say that I would like to interact more with the School of Public Health than I have also doing a postdoc during the pandemic where everything's online, it's been hard to like meet people and interact generally. So overall positive, but more interaction needed perhaps. That's a really great question. Thanks Ruby. Um, I would say, even though I am in, a, I'm in the division for the first time as a postdoc, I had loose ties um, throughout my um, time as a PhD student. And so, um, I uh, got my PhD in the Department of Nutrition here at the U and my um, advisor was already doing some body composition work. And I knew that Ellen was also doing some body composition work and um, she had an association, an established collaboration with um, Dr. Sarah Rammel, who's a neonatologist over in the medical school. So I kind of inadvertently got connected with Ellen um, that way. But also um, I was also really interested in epidemiology. It's just incredibly fascinating and I think um, looking at my work as a clinician, I'm often treating as a dietitian, I'm kind of treating the downstream effects of what happens, um, what are the consequences um, of, um, you know, patterns that we see in public health. And so um, I was really interested in exploring that further. And so I decided to do a minor in epi and that kind of introduced me to some of the faculty um, in the division. Um, I was in uh, Susan Mason and Pam Lutze's epi one class and 
um, also took FE2 um, with uh, Rachel Widom. And so I think those were really formative experiences for me and um, understanding the quality of the research being done in the division and then um, just deciding like, you know what, I think this is a, this would be a really good fit for me um, to combine my clinical um, interests, but also with my interest in public health. So, um, and then, you know, choosing to come um, here for um, a postdoc, I think um, I already had some established connections with Ellen, but um, I kind of wanted to want to dismantle like that whole perception that you, you need to work with new people. You can't, you know, keep working with the same people because um, I feel like, you know, you, you establish kind of this little niche area in your PhD, but you don't fully explore it um, necessarily. And so because I've been continuing to work with Ellen, I've been able to dive into so many areas of um, previously unexplored research with her and um, that I hadn't, you know, I hadn't done any milk research previously. So um, I think to me, that was a big advantage continuing to, you know, strengthen and um, grow that uh, uh, relationship and mentorship. And um, personally, I think of that I've really benefited from continuing to work with the same uh, mentor across my PhD and my postdoc. Wonderful. Again, an excellent presentation by both of you. Thank you so much. And for the rest of you, I hope to see you all back next week. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Nagel. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.